to be looking at some statements that Jesus made. Those of us that grew up in the church, uh, there's some statements that he made in the book of John that started with the words, I am. And so Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And John is the only one that records these words. But to the original audience, when Jesus began to say, I am, it, it was like a bell was ringing in their head. It was an echo from the past because those words were foundational to the people of God, Israel, some 1,400 years before Jesus. And so I don't know if you have ever been in the car and a song comes on the radio and it transports you to a different time in a different place. A song comes on the radio and all of a sudden, instead of being in your car on Newberry Road, you're back in your friend's bedroom listening to a literal mixtape. How many of you know what I'm talking about? A literal mixtape that like your buddy made by facing two radios together and like hitting the record button. Yeah, some, some of you young ones are like, what are you talking about? I have this iPod um, and I hear about these mixtapes, but you're listening to a mixtape and it takes you to that time and place. So this is what I want you to do. We're going to have some fun this morning and I want you to take your phone out. All right. Take your phone. You're like, I thought we were supposed to put them away in church. No, not when I'm preaching, you're not. All right, get them out. And so this is what we're going to do. And for those of you that are watching on the live stream, I apologize. This is one of the reasons you need to come uh, to church is... Due to some copyright stuff, we're not going to be able uh, to, to play the songs over the live stream on the internet, all right? So we're going to black out here for a few minutes, and then we're going to welcome you back. My whole point with this is, when Jesus began to, to say these phrases, I am, I am the bread of life, I am the true vine, I am the way, the truth, and the life— that those two words, I am, were like the lyrics of a song that took those original hearers back 1,400 years. Sometimes we make the mistake of saying, back in Bible times, see, we're about 2,000 years removed from Jesus. But Jesus was 1,400 years removed from Moses. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Sometimes we have this book and we think that they were all bunched up right there together. But we're removed about 2,000 years from Jesus. And then Jesus was removed about 1,400 years from Moses. And for those of you that have grown up in the church, many of you know the story of Moses. But for those of you that haven't, there was this guy named Moses. And he had a brother named Aaron. And God chose them to use them to free God's people Israel from the Egyptians. And so... Moses had kind of a unique uh, upbringing. Uh, he was placed in a basket as a baby and, and put in the Nile River. And then uh, a very important Egyptian found him and raised him. But then when Moses was an adult, there was this incident where he was standing up for an injustice where he killed someone who was doing wrong to one of God's people. And so he went on the run. He, he, was, he did not want to be captured uh, by the authorities. And so he began to, to be a shepherd. He was, he was tending to the sheep of his father-in-law, who was from Alabama. And we know this because his name was Jethro. His name was Jethro. Little Bible trivia that I know you weren't aware of. Before, he, he was tending these sheep, and so he was up on the mountain Hor Horeb, and all of a sudden there was this, this bush that appeared to be burning. In fact, there was, a, there was a flame in it, but the interesting thing was that it wasn't burning up. The flame just stayed there. And like any curious person, Moses made his way over to this bush. You're like, you're making this story up. No, it's in Exodus 3. Go home and read it, all right? And so he makes his way over there, and then a voice comes out of the bush. And it says, don't come any closer. And as a matter of fact, take your shoes off. Because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. And so God begins to speak to Moses 
through this bush. And God says some very interesting things to Moses. He says three things, and they're going to come up on the screen. I have seen the misery of my people. I have seen the misery. I have heard the cries. I know their sufferings. And so Moses is having this kind of crazy God moment. Have you ever had one of those crazy God moments? Maybe not like this crazy, but where God begins speaking, and he's like, hey, I know all about the slavery. I have seen the misery. I have heard the cries, and I have known the suffering. And that's good. And those are encouraging words. And I'm sure for Moses, it's like, okay, well, at least God knows what's going on. Have you ever been there? You're going through the mess of life, and you have this idea that that God has seen your misery, that he has heard the cries, and he has known your sufferings. But my next logical question is, well, what are you going to do about it? It's good that you, you have seen, that you have heard, that you have known But what are you going to do about it? And this is where God drops a bombshell. And he says to Moses, I have come down. He he says, I have come down. I am here. And I'm going to deliver you from the land of slavery and lift you up into the promised land. So God doesn't, he goes beyond saying, well, I've seen and I've heard and I have known. What he is telling Moses is, I have come now to make a difference, and I want to use you to do it. Well, this was all good with Moses. He was glad that that God had heard and seen and had known, and he wanted God to do something. But as soon as God told him, I want to use you, whoo, up come the excuses. All kinds of excuses. Have you ever been there? You pray for God to do something? God, I really need you to move. I really need you to act. And he's like, awesome, I'm ready to do something. And I want to use you. And you're like, whoa, whoa. I didn't mean that. I meant like you do something and I'll stand on the side and like cheer you on, God. Like I'll tell everybody about what you did. But that's not what God does. Typically, that's not what God does. God says, yeah, I want to do something and I want to use you to do it. And so Moses he, he begins the excuses. Well, well who, who am I? Who am I? Nobody knows who I am. I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. I don't have my act together. And oh yeah, whoever's speaking through the bush, I don't know if you know this, but, but I killed somebody. I'm a murderer. I don't think that you want to use me. God doesn't really care about that. He sees through it all. And essentially what he tells Moses is, I will be with you through the whole thing. In verse 12, Exodus chapter 3, it says this. Just listen. I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Now, this is a little bit crazy. And I actually, as I was going over this this morning, this stood out to me. God tells Moses that he is going to give him a sign. But the sign isn't going to show up until after God, until after Moses has done what God has asked him to do. See, we want the sign on the front end. God, if if I'm supposed to do this, I need you to give me a sign. But what God told Moses is, here's the sign. The sign's going to come afterwards. After you have done what I'm asking you to do, the sign will be that the people that you draw out of that land are going to worship me on the mountain. So you're going to have to do what I'm asking you to do before I'm going to give you the sign that I was with you. Does that sound backwards to anybody else? We want the sign. I saw the sign. (laughs) It opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. We want the sign here. But at least in this story, God's saying, no, I need you to act in obedience. And then when we get towards the end, I will give you the sign that I was with you all along. Ooh, that's good stuff right there. That is good stuff. Notice what God doesn't say. He doesn't say, okay, Moses, I'm going to give you a healthy dose of self-esteem. I'm going to make you feel important enough. 
I know you tell me that you stutter, and you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and fix that for you, make you eloquent. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say to Moses, I'm going to make you brave enough, or I'm going to give you knowledge so that you can impress them with, with what you know. He doesn't say that. He simply says, I will be there with you. I will be there. And then the sign is going to come at the end. And then Moses Moses says something that I think that we can all relate to. He says, but I don't even know your name. If I go to the Israelites and say, the, the God of your ancestors has sent me and they want to know your name, what am I supposed to say? Have you ever realized that in life's big moments, you want to know who you're dealing with? In the Lowry household, we had a bad day recently. And I'm not going to go into all of the details, but we had a bad day. And my wife had, had gotten a job at, at a new school, and we, we were, oh, man, this is awesome. God has provided this for us because she was going to be working with a principal that she had worked with before, and it was, it was going to be awesome. And so the day that she went to set up her office to work with this awesome principal, the principal called my wife into his office and said, well, i got to tell you something. Some interesting things have happened in the last 12 hours. Um, the school that you just resigned your position to leave to come to work for me, I just got assigned to be the principal of that school. <laughs> and so the very school that you just left to come here and we could work together, well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And so we're like, whoa, this is, this is crazy. And so it was, it was a bad day. But later that afternoon, just for a few moments, the day seemed like it was getting a little bit better because the phone rang. My family got a phone call informing us that we had won $1.5 million. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's why I'm wearing these fancy clothes. <laughs> Heather, you have won $1.5 million. Dollars. This is awesome. This is so good. They said, do you remember filling out that form? Which is the perfect question to ask my wife. Because there is no form anywhere that she won't fill out. You going to give me a t-shirt? You going to give me a sling bag? That's right, I'm filling out your form. Put me on whatever email list, whatever call list you want to put me on. Sign me up. And now here is the kicker. About a year and a half ago, she filled out one of these forms and we got one of these calls. And we literally won $750 in free groceries. Like that did happen. So this isn't out of the realm of possibility in my home. But then the person said, all I need <laughs> is your address. <laughs> I said, Heather. Don't you think that would have been part of what you put on the form that you filled out? She said, all, all he needs is our address. I said, did you give him our address? She said, no, I gave him our neighbor's address. <laughs> she did not say that. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Three houses down. So towards the end of this conversation... My wife has the presence of mind to say, what is your name? This is a big moment. We're about to get $1.5 million. You want to know who you're dealing with? What was his name? John. <laughs> no. <laughs> John. She said, okay, John, where are you? He goes, I'm right down the street from your house. I'm in a big black truck. I'm, I'm getting gas in Orlando. I'm right down the street from your house in Orlando. I said, Heather, please tell me you gave this man nothing about us. She did not, but it was interesting. She wanted to know his name. And apparently, John didn't sound trustworthy enough. <laughs> Alas, we did not win the $1.5 million. But her, first que her last question was, what is your name? See, names are important. They were especially important to Moses. As I said, he grew up in an Egyptian home, and names had meaning. In fact, his name, Moses, meant to draw 
out, as he was drawn out of the water. Names have meaning. It's no wonder that Moses wanted a name to pass along to those that he was supposed to lead out of slavery into freedom. God responds with this. He says, I am that I am. You tell them, I am sent you. Now, the interesting thing is that there are a lot of Hebrew scholars who are willing to translate this phrase like this. I will be there. Howsoever, I will be there. There's a pastor, Rob Fuqua, who says, God is saying, I will be there. What you need, you need me more than power and ability. Let that be enough. And Moses has a decision to make. And listen to this. Will he wait to be faithful until God makes him feel adequate? Or will he act faithfully and trust in God's adequacy? I'm going to say that one more time. And let's not make it about Moses. Let's make it about us. Will we wait to be faithful until God makes us feel adequate? Or will we act faithfully and trust in God's adequacy? It almost sounds like maybe God is stirring something up within us. And we're standing here waiting for the sign. And what God is saying is, no, you need to act in obedience. And when you get over here, I'm going to reveal to you that I was with you the whole time. There's a comedian named Michael Jr. And he tells the story of performing at a maximum security prison. And the truth is, he wasn't at the prison to do a show. He was, he was going to meet the warden and to do some other things, maybe arrange a show for a future date. But the warden requested that he do an impromptu show, and, and Michael Jr. felt nudged by God to go ahead and do it. And he says, I, I was passing through the halls, and I began to hear the doors slam and lock behind me as we went farther and farther into the prison. And he said, um, Lord, I'm not prepared. Because doing comedy to a bunch of prisoners is a, a little bit different context than just doing comedy to people who had paid and were expecting you to be funny. He said, I'm not prepared. And he entered the room and he was met with a bunch of hard blank stares in a room, a room filled with felons. And he kept thinking, all right, now, Lord, now, now would be a good time to give me something funny to say. I'm supposed to be funny, and I've got nothing. And so he made his way to the front of the crowd after he was introduced, but he still had nothing. His mind was completely blank. And as soon as he stepped behind the microphone, he looked into the front row. There sat a man with a long white beard with the name tag Moses on the front of his shirt. He thought, thank you, Lord. I can do something with this. And so he looked down at that man and he said, who better to be in prison with than a guy named Moses? And he pointed at that man and he said, listen, Moses, I want you to go to the warden right now. And this is what I want you to tell him. Let my people go. <laughs> the place erupted and the show was like unlike anything that he had ever experienced. God showed up in that moment. And what he discovered that day is that God would give him what he needed when his feet were where God wanted them to be. He discovered that day that God would give him what he needed when his feet were where God wanted him to be. There seems to be a theme here that maybe, maybe we're stuck here and God's saying, no, no, no. I don't promise to give you anything more than you already have, except I promise that my presence will be with you. And when we get here, you're going to be able to look back and you're going to see my hand in all of this. And so this phrase, as Jesus begins to say, I am, and he follows that up, that this echo from the past begins to reverberate within the, within the people that hear it. And for his original audience, part of what Jesus was doing was connecting himself to the God of Moses. Another thing that Jesus was doing is he was, 
he talks about these images in contrast to their opposites. He begins saying, I am the bread of life, and he talks about it in opposition to hunger. He begins to say that I am enough for you. He begins to talk about being the light in contrast to darkness. He talks about being a good shepherd who truly cares for his sheep, which is always better than a hired hand that is just collecting a paycheck. He talks about being a true vine. And he takes these common images for his original audience. And what he's ultimately proclaiming is that people's religious needs are fulfilled in him. There's no need to search any farther. He's saying in all of these different teachings, in me, you will find enough. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to begin breaking these down. And we're also going to begin to realize that more than just defining who God is, we're going to be digging in and seeing how these statements lay claim to us. Because you see, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But in another place, he says, you are the light of the world. He's inviting us into him. I am the good shepherd. But then what does he tell us? Feed my sheep. He says, I am the true vine, but guess what? You are the branches. We are connected. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And later his followers were known to be a part of something called the way. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. But Then he invites us into that resurrected life. Beyond these statements, helping us understand who God is, they lay claim to us And if we allow them, they begin to define us as well. We have a God who sees, who hears, and knows our situations. He promises he will be here with us and will provide what we need when we need it. When we are faithful to be where he wants us to be. I have a phrase that I want us to to read together as we close our time together this morning, and it's going to come up on the screen. I'll start, just read along out loud with me. Who we are is defined by God. Who, who, uh, let's start that over. This may not be the best sentence I ever wrote. (laughs) Who we are is defined by who God is and how he is inviting us into life in him. One more time. Who we are is defined by who God is and how he is inviting us into life in him. And so this is our hope, that you will join us uh, over the, the next four to six weeks as we begin to unpack these things and realize that our definition, who we are, is defined by who we are in him. If you're a guest with us today and you're like, I'm not into all this Jesus stuff, that's fine. You don't have to buy in all the way. Come and hang out with us. Come and hang out with us and see if God doesn't begin to speak to you a little bit. If you've been around the church 70 years and you're like, I've taught this in Sunday school 25 times, that's fine. Come hang out. Maybe God will reveal something new to you as well. Let's pray. God. We thank you that as we have read and as we have sung today, that that who we are is defined by who we are in you. And God, I pray that we would be a people of obedience, that that some of us who are stuck over here waiting on a sign from you, when you have made it clear to us what it is that you are inviting us into, we want you to make a difference, you want to make a difference, but you want to use us to do it, and up to this point we've been unwilling. God, may we begin to take the baby steps over here to the other side, trusting that we will be able to look back and see your hand leading and guiding in all of it. We pray all of these things in the resurrected name of your son, Jesus. Amen.